Hi y'all. So when I say the words body positivity, what comes to your mind? Go on, take a minute, really think about it. For some of you, the word might be associated with positive thoughts about empowerment and self-love and fat acceptance. For others, the word might be associated with delusion and unhealthy behaviors. And for others still, the word might conjure anger and hatred and contempt and judgment. Needless to say, body positivity is a polarizing movement and one I would like to examine in this video. Truth be told, I was prompted to make this video because of the responses to another video I made. If you haven't watched that video, that's okay, but I would highly suggest you go watch it to give it, this video a little bit more context. I was attempting in that video to do a cultural analysis of a trend that I found a little troubling. Although we can debate whether or not I did a good job achieving my goals in that video, there was an interesting response. People in the comments were quick to mention the body positive movement and the intolerance that they've experienced from a movement that is meant to spread love and positivity. Based on those comments, it got me thinking, has the body positivity movement strayed from its original goal? Is the body positivity movement still preaching love, tolerance, and acceptance, or has its mission morphed into something wholly unrecognizable? Or is the movement victim to hatred from people with internalized and externalized fat phobia? I thought we would explore these questions and really examine or do a post-mortem of the body positivity movement. So let's take it back to the beginning. The body positivity movement as we know it originated in the fat acceptance movement of the 1960s. This movement was created in response to the general idea that fatness equated to laziness and that fat people were not active members of society and were actually worth less than skinnier people. Additionally, the rise in popularity of fad diets and the introduction of stick thin supermodels like Twiggy led to the growing backlash resulting in the first fat in, in 1967, where over 500 people flooded into Central Park to protest the unequal treatment of fat people by society. These protesters burned diet books, ate food, and paraded around with signs to bring awareness and attention to fat bias in society. Now before continuing, I think it's important to acknowledge that this radical fat acceptance movement was undoubtedly inspired by the civil rights movement and takes a lot of cues from that movement. There is also no doubt that these intersecting political movements took inspiration from each other, so I think that's just important to note. Back into the history of the fat acceptance movement. In 1967, Lou Lauterbach published the article More People Should Be Fat in the Sunday Evening Post. In this piece, Lou comments on how people discriminated against his wife, who was fat. Also, just a note here, I will be referring to people as fat, not as a pejorative term, but just as a way that the people in the fat community preferred to be called, so I just wanted to address that. But the article by Lou Lauterbach was instrumental in calling attention to fat phobia and helped propel fat discrimination into the spotlight. Additionally, this article facilitated the meeting between Lou and William Fabry. These two would go on to form the National Association to Aid Fat Americans, or NAFA, in 1969. NAFA was originally conceived as a grassroots organization focused on promoting fat acceptance and highlighting weight discrimination in American society. They still exist today, although their name has changed slightly with the acronym mean, but they hold an annual conference and participate in fat rights issues. So if you're interested, I would definitely consider go checking out their website. In 1972, four years after NAFA was established, a feminist group out of Los Angeles founded the Fat Underground. This group started as a radical chapter of, of NAFA, but over time it became its own thing. FU, as they were appropriately called, love that acronym, are a more confrontational version of the fat acceptance movement. Founded by Judy Free Spirit, Sarah Aldebaran, later known as Sarah Fishman, FU began focusing on the discriminatory practices of physicians when it came to weight. Specifically, FU took inspiration from the radical therapy movement, which sought to reform the mental health profession by changing society, not changing the individual. FU took these principles and applied them to general physicians. There are so many quotes that I love from this movement and ones that I found online, but I will just list a few here. And some of their mantras include, a diet is a cure that doesn't work for a disease that doesn't exist. 
Or how about this one? Doctors are the enemy, weight loss is genocide. Catchy, catchy, catchy. But as you can imagine, these ideas were met with mixed reactions at the time. Most people within the mainstream fat acceptance movement were concerned that this rhetoric was too aggressive and implored FU to tamper down their ideas. However, it is not considered a radical movement for nothing. And slowly these ideas infiltrated the mainstream fat acceptance movement and were adopted as tenets of the movement as a whole. A year later in 1973, Fishman and Free Spirit published the Fat Liberation Manifesto. This manifesto outlines the basic basic goals and objectives of the fat acceptance movement and delineates what FU thinks fat people are entitled to. Spoiler, it's just basic human rights. Crazy concept, I know. Again, I would suggest giving it a read in its entirety if you're invested. Even though it lacks a little bit of perspective, it still holds up quite well for being made in the 1970s. Although I will not read the whole entire thing, I will read the first point because I think it's the most important and the biggest one to highlight. The first point from the Fat Liberation Manifesto is, one, we believe that fat people are fully entitled to human respect and recognition. Although that sounds silly, it is important to reaffirm this statement even today. And at the time, this manifesto united fat people under a common goal. Like many other movements of the time, most notably the feminist movement, the fat acceptance movement has a few different waves, so to speak. The history I just explained from the 1960s through the 1970s and kind of through the like early 80s was considered the first wave of the fat acceptance movement. This wave mainly focused on fat women and coincided with the second wave of feminism. As the movement progressed into the second wave in the 1980s and 90s, it started to extend to other genders, sexualities, races, classes, and became more widespread, even entering into other countries other than the United States. During the second wave, the fat acceptance movement was also finding its way into academic literature, becoming a field of study called fat studies. This type of academic study focused on weight discrimination, fat phobia, and general health bias. Needless to say, the 80s and the 90s were a good time for the fat acceptance movement. But as the movement continued to grow, it hit a big hurdle in the late 90s and early thousands. During this Y2K era, the fat acceptance movement hit a bit of a rough patch. This period of time was ripe for body criticism, fat phobia, and general negative diet culture. The introduction of the internet changed the landscape and the fat acceptance movement had to keep up with the times. This was not the first time this movement had encountered significant pushback. From its inception, the fat acceptance movement has faced criticism and ridicule from people accusing them of promoting obesity and living unhealthy lifestyles to basically being like Satan on earth. With the advert of the internet, this criticism just became anonymous and we all know that anonymity makes people more confident and the hate and criticism got a little louder. However, with the invention of the internet and the proliferation of social media sites, the fat acceptance movement also began adapting their message. Like other movements before and after it, the fat acceptance movement realized that they could harness the power of social media to expand their message to new populations. This exposure helped propel fat acceptance into circles it had not previously broached before. And the invention of the hashtag body positivity movement would see almost unmitigated growth. Before we get into the body positivity movement, I would like to take this moment to discuss fatness as a concept. Now, I am not a fat study scholar, nor do I identify as a fat person. So I would like to acknowledge that all of this is based on the research I did, and I am just trying to convey it and relay this information that I learned in the best way possible. So. It is important to note that fatness is not a 20th or 21st century condition or state of being. In fact, people have been obese or fat since well before that. Although there is no real estimate on when the first fat person existed on this planet, there are depictions of fat people dating back to 25,000 BC with the Willendorf Venus being a particularly famous depiction of fatness being associated with fertility. And although fatness has different connotations throughout history and in different cultures, it is usually a status symbol for the wealthy to show off their ability to eat rich foods and that are unavailable to the commoner. Or in some cases, fat people were just seen as jovial and merry. Think Santa Claus. But there are so many literary and artistic examples of fat people being praised throughout history for being lovely and fun. Although fat people were seen as wealthy, beautiful, and fertile, as time progressed, there was more examination of what it meant to be fat. And there was a growing concern that being fat was being unhealthy. Now, I'm not going to say that fatness only began being pathologized in the 
20th and 21st centuries because that's not true. There are numerous historical records of people describing being fat as a disease or that it led to certain comorbidities including heart disease and diabetes. And even in the 1700s, Tobias Venner wrote that obesity was a societal disease, which was the first time obesity began being widely considered as a societal problem. The tide really began to shift during the Industrial Revolution though, when industries began valuing their workers based on their bodies and their manual labor they produced instead of for their internal value. This was further exacerbated by the World Wars when soldiers were expected to have powerful and slim physiques to withstand the brutality of war. All of these led to the devaluing of people with bigger bodies in favor of slimness. Now, this is not the whole story and there is so much more to say about how the evolution of fatness became what it is today, but this is just like an overview generally of like how fatness became demonized and stigmatized in modern day society. And for the, our purposes and for this video, all we need to know is that fatness began to fall out of favor heavily in the 20th and 21st century and actively began being demonized in those centuries and has kind of progressed into where we are today. So like I said in the beginning, the 20th century specifically and the 21st century continuing on the theme was filled with fat phobia, but it was all presented under the guise of being more healthy. And this refrain is still the major battle cry of people who don't agree with the fat acceptance or body positivity movements. So before we move on to what the body positivity movement actually looks like now, I think it's important to set the record straight. Is being fat unhealthy. Now you and I both know it is not that simple and I take particular umbrage with this talking point or arguments specifically because I don't think it's made in good faith. I think that there are some people who genuinely think that being fat can lead to adverse health effects and we will address that. But I think for the most part, it's more common for people to label their internalized fat phobia as just being concerned for their well-being. There are so many articles, think pieces, and podcasts that do a far better job addressing fatness and its intersections with health. But I will just share a few things that I think are relevant. Number one, yes, there are some correlations in some scientific articles that show that there's connections between carrying extra body weight and some adverse health outcomes. But this is a correlation and not a causation. Obesity and being overweight may contribute to the risk of developing conditions like type 2 diabetes, but this is not a certainty. And not every single obese person has adverse health outcomes associated with their weight. Which leads me into number two. Fat people are not lazy and a lot of them work out and eat more healthy than skinny people. It is incorrect to say that fat people live a more unhealthy lifestyle because that may or may not be true. It is also unhelpful and incorrect to say that being fat is a choice and that with willpower, determination, and the right diet plan, a fat person can just lose the weight. And I think that's the crux of this issue. Putting a whole group of people into one box is not helpful and is unproductive in an some cases actually very harmful. By assuming that a fat person is unhealthy solely based on their weight and then assuming a skinny person is healthy also because of their weight just reduces a person down to the most uninteresting part about them which is their body weight and shape. At the end of the day we don't know how healthy a fat person is because we're not their doctors or them or their family members. And frankly, that's just none of our business. And another thing to know is that in most cases, anti-fat bias and stigma can actually be more harmful than actually being fat. Fat people are discriminated against in almost all settings, and this can lead to negative mental, physical, and emotional outcomes. If people actually cared about the health and well-being of fat people, they would address fat phobia and systematic factors that contribute to fat phobia, weight-based stigma, and discrimination. And one thing I want to mention here that I just want to like pop in is the misinformed idea that fat people, by simply existing and loving themselves and their bodies, are promoting obesity. Honestly, this is such a horrible thing to say and to think, and it's such a self-centered perspective. We have no idea what that person is going through. And also some people just can't lose weight on command and or some people just don't want to lose the weight. So some people are just existing in bigger bodies and fatter bodies. And what are they supposed to do? Rot away and never enjoy themselves in their lives ever again? I think some people believe genuinely that fat people should just center their whole entire lives around losing weight. And if they are to be perceived by the general public, they should be constantly engaged in self-flagellation and body hatred. That is so silly and so cruel 
Fat people are people. That shouldn't be a hard or revolutionary concept, that they deserve to love themselves and have rich and fulfilling lives not centered around their weight. Just because a fat person is existing does not mean they are promoting obesity. That is just silly. And if you actually think that, you are the problem. And I think you, if you actually believe that, need to engage in some self reflection and some self-love and mind your own business. Anyway, I need to get off my soapbox and we need to get into the main course, which we've set the stage for. We're discussing the actual body positivity movement. So as I mentioned, with the introduction of social media, the fat acceptance movement had to adjust their message and method of delivery. This led to fat people posting OOTDs or outfits of the day, selfies, and generally just posting about their daily lives, showing how fat people can live long and fulfilling lives. Eventually, members of this movement slowly posted using the hashtag body positivity. This hashtag would be the new calling card of this movement, and as time would progress, devolve into something completely different than the fat acceptance movement. So what is body positivity? Well, the body positivity movement is centered around accepting all bodies and challenging societal beauty norms. This movement is heavily focused on self-love and positive body acceptance, regardless of the person's shape, size, race, and ability. Now, on the surface, there is nothing wrong with this message. People should develop healthy relationships with their bodies while understanding the societal stigma surrounding body shape. However, if you've noticed, this movement and the principles of the body positivity movement co-ops the principles of the fat acceptance movement and applies this concept to all bodies. Originally, this movement, the fat acceptance movement, was led by fat people for fat people to help reduce stigma and address the real harms that fat people incur by simply existing. But as time progressed, the movement got applied to all body types, and the fat people who led the movement slowly got sidelined. People with slimmer and smaller body sizes started using the language of the body positivity movement and excluding the people who originated the movement. Not only were people with bigger bodies being excluded from the movement that they helped create, but the movement also started excluding marginalized populations. According to an article by Lazuka et al. 2020, and an, an analysis of 250 body body positivity posts found that 67% or two thirds of all the posts were made by white creators. So the movement that was built upon creating a community for fat people of diverse backgrounds was now being utilized by smaller bodied white women or white people for internet clout. Also, as the movement became more mainstream, not only did it begin being co-opted by individuals, it also began being co-opted by companies such as Dove. Dove began to use language of the body positivity movement to pander towards their audience. Companies began using performative activism to sell products, which is once again antithetical to the anti-capitalist spirit of the original movement. Another issue with the movement was its perpetuation of toxic positivity. Seeing constant messaging that you should love your body unconditionally can actually have adverse effects. As humans, it's almost impossible to feel happy and positive towards your body at all times. And by pushing these beliefs that you should always be thankful and loving towards your body, we are setting people up for failure when they can't achieve these lofty goals. The body positivity movement is rigid on its ideals and does not allow people to have bad days or go through, allow them to go through rough periods with their bodies or want to lose weight or change their body in any way. Unless you love your body at all times, you have failed. This messaging can cause adverse reactions and consequently make people more insecure and upset because they can't fit in with the mission statement of the movement. In general, these are just a few critiques that have been leveled against the body positivity movement. This criticism has led to people not viewing the body positivity as welcoming anymore. And for some, this has actually led to them kind of stepping away and not engaging with the movement. Now, it may seem harsh, and some people may perceive it as gatekeeping to say that only certain people can claim body positivity, but that was not the original intention of the fat acceptance movement. Although a lot of people have felt societal pressure about their body and may have experienced adverse or negative things said about their body, not every single person actually goes through societal and systemic discrimination, stigma, and hatred towards their weight. The body positivity movement as an extension of the fat acceptance movement was originally supposed to create space for people who had been discriminated and disparaged against by uplifting them and celebrating them and showing them and showing them that they can be loved. 
But instead of being a safe space for fat people to share positivity and show love towards their bodies, it became a co-opted place for performative activism and toxic positivity. The body positivity movement really had its heyday during the late 2010s, but now the issues with the movement have been well documented and people are seeking other outlets to express their thoughts and feelings about their bodies. There have been many schools of thought about how to view your body and how to combat weight-based stigma. For instance, the Health at Every Size movement, a more recent example of a movement born from the fat acceptance movement and body positivity movement, focuses on how to eliminate weight stigma throughout the healthcare system. And that is just one example of a way that you can think about and look at your body through a kind of radical lens. But I would briefly like to discuss the offshoot of the movement I find myself gravitating towards most, which is the body neutrality movement. So like the body positivity movement, body neutrality focuses on moving away from body hatred and disgust towards more positive body love. However, the body neutrality movement is more about acceptance than positive positive love. It's more about seeing love as a spectrum and not a linear journey. This movement accepts that some days you may not love your body and that's okay. Additionally, body neutrality focuses on your body's abilities and not so much on the shape and form of your body. For instance, a body neutral thought might be, my body is amazing because it helps me participate in activities I enjoy. In general, I appreciate the movement because it doesn't lead to toxic positivity and at this point it hasn't been co-opted for performative activism. But this is not to say that this body neutrality movement doesn't also have its flaws, but I think I like this approach to looking at and viewing your body more than the body positivity movement. So if you're interested, I'll leave some links below. Whew, okay, wow, that was a lot to cover. And this is not even like half, this is just a very brief skim of the history of the body positivity and fat acceptance movements. And although there's a lot I could say, I will keep this conclusion brief. Do I think the body positivity movement is bad? No, of course I don't. I think it was built upon a solid foundation of fat acceptance and radical love. But do I think it has abandoned its mission? Yeah, I do. I think it has long strayed from its roots and it has sidelined and ostracized the people who made the movement successful in the first place. Now, I think the body positivity movement is more of a lightning rod for the radical and passionate proponents looking for validation, capitalist companies looking to co-op the name and the brand, and haters looking for a way to kind of roast and make fun of fat people. Either way, I think it is time for us to move forward and create more responsive and inclusive movements that actually center fat folks and folks of different abilities from all walks of life. But again, I am only one voice and I'm not speaking for the perspective of a fat person. So I think that I would highly encourage you to seek out fat creators who actually have a stake in this and who have like real opinions that should be centered instead of mine. So I highly encourage you to go seek out fat creators who have a more nuanced take on this topic. I just wanted to provide a brief history with a few interjections and opinions of, uh, about the body positive movement and the fat acceptance movement. Anyway, this is a long one. I really hope you enjoy it. I had so much fun looking into this and really was excited about this topic. So I hope to see you in the next one. Um, bye.